Hi, this is Russ, and we're getting ready to go over session uh, 10 in uh, Freedom Encounters course and the passivity of will. Sometimes <laughs> in our lives, uh, we don't want to do something. And uh, maybe we're tired, maybe we're sleepy, maybe we've eaten too much uh, turkey, and uh, the tryptophan is working in our bodies, and uh, we're sleepy. Uh, but what we're going to talk about here goes way beyond this. Now listen, a very good work to get if you want to study some time is uh, Jesse Penn Lewis' War on the Saints, a classic work in the area of spiritual warfare, also the, the effects of revival, the satanic works, cooperating with God. It deals with the issue of uh, the passivity of will and mind. Uh, this is what Satan, you know, in, in, in the reference to this book, uh, loves to work with passivity of mind, passivity of will. Now, I came out of a Buddhist background somewhat and learned Golden Buddha and the concept of, um, and even the Hindu and the, and the pantheistic, uh, you know, transcendental meditations and so forth, the Eastern and New Age uh, uh, practices involve this passivity of will. I don't mind becoming quiet before the Lord. That's not the same as passivity of will. Passivity of will can come from a demonic teaching. Uh, it can also come from life's pains and issues well take a look at your notes on page 25 and may the lord jesus christ give us insight on the issue of passivity of will so far everything you're learning right now can be applied to each and every individual you deal with in the field <clears throat> or in your office and you know ultimately applied to those of many of you who are working with um sra mpd did uh, and mind control issues. <clears throat> All of this involves in dealing because there is also passivity of will in, in that area, which we'll talk about in a few moments. Passivity of will, as I mentioned, can come from uh, Eastern, you know, again, I believe occultic level teaching uh, where the demonic really does teach the, the human uh, will and mind and so forth not to be engaged, to open up to anything and everything, therefore allowing uh, deception and seduction and the work of the enemy to come in. Passivity of will also occurs on in 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 many how they've been raised and so in in the pain and influence. You know, some people have lost all hope and they're depressed. And you'll find in those who've lost hope, those who are depressed, and depression is a big issue. It's a multi-million-dollar uh, issue in the industry uh, in the area of uh, drugs for the issue of depression. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. Uh, depression is primarily cognitive issues, life issues, and uh, there's very crushing, hurting things. The psalm writer talks about anguish, and it talks about trouble and pressure. Paul talks about this, as we already mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where he feels pressured, he feels the sentence of death beyond what they can bear. He talks about this later in chapter 6, about the perplexity. Um, that they're, that he's going through. And believers can feel great pain and perplexity and confusion and all these things. Too much of it, uh, when we succumb and we don't have a way out, leads to, well, in psychology they call it abula, the will not to will, kind of a catatonic thing, um, to where we're, we're so beaten down by the issues that uh, we don't will to, to will anything. We don't do anything. Thus, a highly depressed person, you know, they're not going to take showers, they're not going to eat right, they're not going to get out of bed, they're not going to go to work. Uh, they have a real big problem with decisions. They can't make decisions. Uh, they fear, and there's so much, uh, been, they've been robbed. Well, excuse me, at the top of page 25, uh, the will. Will is what God has come to engage and liberate. Obviously. Uh, because what? The will is the person. You can't be an individual identity without the idea of will. Cardea is the Greek word for heart, which uh, involves mind, emotion, and will. Uh, inseparably, mind, will. Because in your mind, you, 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 know, you think things, you deal with things, uh, and uh, your feelings follow what's going on in your head, your mind, your mental activity. And from that combination of mental activity, how you feel sometimes, uh, good or bad, uh, involves the engagement then of choice, and the will is engaged. 
but there are difficulties in this issue. It is the place of choice. It is also the place of battle. To do anything, you must choose. Taking this course is a choice. Choosing, and let me again encourage you, use the notes, pray and ask the Spirit of God to lead you, to give you more. You may be, you know, listen, integrate all the other information you've received at this point. Integrate all the information you're getting up to this point and, and add uh, precept upon precept. Learn. Uh, sharpen. Let the Spirit of God remind you of uh, how you've counseled before and ministered before, what you've studied, other training, who you're dealing with, and even let Him speak to you uh, in these sessions. Because I've taught sessions like this for years upon years, and I see in every one of these sessions that God ministers directly to the learners who are learning to do ministry for others. And that's happened again and again especially when I went to Emerge Counseling Center to their training on crisis counseling, on marriage counseling, on suicide issue counseling, on biblical, you know, any of the counseling, you know, training. I, I, I sometimes came through thinking, wow, um, you know, God ministered to me in this and that I'm okay in this issue and I need to do this. And, and uh, so allow God to have that interaction and it involves the will also. But the will is a place also of battle. To do anything you must choose choice is at the heart of what we are and become. What you're choosing today, choosing to study, choosing to learn, choosing to grow. Not only, you know, again, it, it, it builds in you. Like the scripture teaches us this principle. To every Christian, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The only way that can happen is for you to get the word of God out and study. Not just for your devotions, but study. I study many times to learn all that I can for what I can use. Um, I don't have to read all that I've read and done all that I've done, but I, I do it for ministry's sake, but I also have benefited deeply. Uh, but to whom much is given, much is required, correct? So in the presence of Jesus, you are learning. In the presence of Jesus, uh, and the actually in this subject here, uh, Philippians 2.13, it is God who is at work, that Greek word work, Again, the supernatural operative power of God. He's at work in you to will and to act according to his good pleasure. He won't make you do it, but he gives you the uh, internal empowerment, influence uh, to want, uh, to want it, you know, to choose, and then to act. He, he gives it to you, but you must then do it. You must then act. And so your choices have a lot to do about with your future. It has a lot to do with your present life and your future life. If you choose to memorize Scripture consistently and really learn and so forth, think about over a year's time how much of the Scripture you can really come to know and experience. If you choose to obey God in the area of evangelism, and you want to be a soul winner as a Christian, um, and so you choose to obey the Word of God to go and, and share, preach the gospel to every creature. Um, and uh, you, so you're out there sharing. Obviously, you're going to win people to Christ. If you've chosen to be involved in uh, in your gifting and calling is in the area of counsel. Um, counsel involves evangelism. It involves discipleship. It involves uh, the healing ministries of Jesus. It, it's at the core of what Jesus has been anointed to do and has anointed you to do in his name. Uh, the liberation of prisoners. Uh, the release of prisoners and the opening of eyes and so forth, the preaching of good news. It all, always begins with that. So it's very important for you to realize that um, uh, because God may speak to you about your own will right now. It is uh, the will that uh, chose uh, the sin in the Garden of Eden. It is the will that can be filled with God, with sin, or even with demons. And I love the verse that I find, I believe in John chapter um, 7, it deals when Jesus is speaking to the crowd and he says, whoever is willing to do my will shall know whether the teaching comes from God. A willingness opens us up to God. <clears throat> Jesus stood outside of Jerusalem and said, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how often I would have taken you up under my wings, but you were not willing. So your house has left you desolate. 
God willed to bring them up, bring them in, uh, but they willed, the Greek word thelema, uh, they willed not to. Uh, in the book of Acts, Stephen is preaching, and he says, you stiff-necked, uncircumcised, and he really lays it on them. He says, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Imagine that. God is trying to bring us to Christ, the world to Christ. God is moving in the believer, and uh, we just need to yield and cooperate and say, yes, God, yes, Holy Spirit, yes, Word of God. To say yes to God, to the Holy Spirit, to the Word of God, is all the same. Uh, to walk in the Spirit is to walk in obedience. To walk in obedience to the Word is to walk in the Spirit. And it's very important that we realize the simplicity of this. Now, in the last session, 9, at the very, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, end of it, we were dealing with uh, the issue of sin. And that has everything to do with the will, too. And we're going to look here concerning the uh, inability of the will when sin is the ruling principle. Page 25, point A, uh, the will is in bondage before salvation. Obviously, that is true. That is what the Word of God would teach in Romans chapter 8, uh, clearly. Uh, that's why the Word of God says in Galatians that the whole world is a prison to sin. So anybody you're dealing with that's not saved is in bondage to sin. Um, and they also have a, a connection to and an ownership from Satan. So take a look at those two things uh, here in your ministry with people and in, in engaging the will of man. We can uh, read about the issue of the sin nature uh, also, again, in Romans 6 or 7, specifically 8, referring to if you're not saved, don't have the Spirit of Christ, the sin nature rules. It's a law of sin and death. It doesn't desire God. It's, it's hostile to God, and by itself will never submit to God. And the other, the other side of that coin is, is that Satan has a, a kind of a hook into that sin nature. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, we read that the prince of the power of the air, uh, the ruler of the power of the air, is now, now, at work. Again, the Greek word meaning an operative supernatural presence and power. At work in the, those who are disobedient. So if people are living in the sin nature, there is a connection to the satanic uh, presence. And uh, so there is a, a sense of uh, binding there. But also, uh, we read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, that when we come to Christ, we have been translated from the dominion of darkness, that ruling authority of darkness, and we've been uh, translated over into uh, the kingdom, the basile of the rule of of God in Christ. So when you come to Jesus Christ, you are marked in God with a seal, the ownership of God. You are now His property. You're bought with a price. You're not your own. And you're no longer under the authority and ownership of Satan. Jesus spoke about this in John chapter 5 and 6. He's dealing with the Jews and uh, their uh, cultic religious claim that they have claimed to God. And Jesus clearly is going to tell them that uh, uh, God, uh, the God of Abraham, is not your father. That Satan, the devil, is your father. He is the operative force and owner of your life. And uh, he deals with them. And he tells them because if they, if they would have believed Moses, that would have been the preparatory uh, leading of God, they would have easily then believed on him. But because they didn't believe the preparatory work of God and rejected it and turned it upside down and made their own cultic religion, uh, they didn't believe in him either. They didn't come to him because they did not follow the Old Testament level of leading, being drawn by Old Testament, uh, the Old Covenant. And uh, without that Old Testament drawing, they can't be drawn and brought to Christ because uh, they didn't believe the Word of God in the first place. They didn't follow and learn from the Father. Anybody who did listen and learn from the Father would be drawn. And now Jesus has come to draw all men, of course, when he's lifted up on the cross and what he does there. But the issue is the inability and the sin nature. Now, there is a sense that the will can be active, but not able in and of itself uh, to get out of the cage. Someone has to come to the cage and open the door. And uh, that is Jesus. Uh, again, if you understand the nature of the anointed one, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon Christ. He's anointed to do what? Uh, to liberate humanity from sin and Satan. Uh, and ultimately from death too. It involves the opening of eyes because sin and Satan blinds. 
You know the scripture in Corinthians, Second Corinthians four four, Satan, who's the god of this world uh, age, blinds the minds of unbelievers. Why? So they cannot see, perceive the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. That Christ is God in human flesh, and that's the operative work of Satan. And uh, what do we do concerning that? Well, we're going to come to that. I just need to tell you that the will is incapacitated when we're not believers in Christ. So whether, whether in your office or whether uh, on the field or if you're dealing with a multiple, you've got this issue of each personality. Um, there's, an inc- there, there, there's a level of the sin nature and the ownership of Satan in each and every part of them. Um, and I know it's a difficult issue. We're going to have four or five sessions that deal just with multiplicity because you're dealing with something beyond the norm. Um, but it, but the same principles apply. Uh, even when a core individual believes, if it's really the core individual person that believes and is born of the Spirit of God, then a victory is assured. It's the idea of uh, sanctification. The healing, delivering process will continue till they're completely freed and, and full in Christ. The other side of the story is uh, that um, many personalities inside cut off from the centrality of the will seem to have their own will. And uh, you'll have to deal with each one accordingly to who they are, what they believe, what they're all about. And that's that's what we're going to be dealing with when we deal with MPD coming up. Uh, and the uh, issue of in- inability is is within each one of those personalities outside of Jesus the liberator. Now, when we talk about this liber, you know, this idea of inability and then, then the liberation, that's where point B comes in and here again comes this beautiful message of good news of great joy, exceeding joy that the angel declares. So we have this great incredible the door to heaven is open, the door to God ministering to lives. That's why I love to be able to say to people God loves you. He does have a great plan for your life. Um, but the issue is that sin and Satan block that, and that there that Christ had to come and die, and that God wants to come into the and, and so the whole issue of evangelization uh, to the non-believer. Now listen, here's what happens though. Point B, uh, the will is empowered and liberated. Uh, let me say at prior to and specifically at salvation. In other words, no one can choose Jesus Christ without the operative work of the Spirit and the Word inseparable work of the Spirit and the Word. Matter of fact, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, and um, the Word of God is the language of the Spirit. We read in the Gospel of John, these things were written, grapha, the writings, that you might believe. And we're also told that the Word of God, the Logos, the written Word of God, is living and active. It has power to penetrate and divide and go in between soul and spirit and and. and um, and uh, and and do the work that it's supposed to do. So we must remember, no matter how big the issue of sin nature is, no matter how incapacitated or in, unable it is to resp- to do anything in and of itself to turn to God, when God peers in through one verse, one verse, uh, the sin nature and Satan himself cannot stop one verse of the Word of God. That's the tremendous news. That's why we're at point B, and it says faith comes from hearing. Romans chapter 10 is the classic chapter on this issue, that uh, the word of faith we are proclaiming, it is near you. And then he goes on to say that, uh, and this is what's very important in our sessions, that and when we're listening to God and writing down, even all the word of God is living and active, but there's times God gives us a specific rhema, people call it a rhema word, a specific word for a specific issue in a specific time. And so when you're mapping out, listening to somebody and writing some notes, or you have a verse come to your mind, you know, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And you can only use what you have. And there's times you know that God reminds you of a part of a verse. You've got to go look it up. That's why the memorization of Scripture, word for word, is vital. And I've got a verse down today that I'm, I've got out as far as a memory verse. Even today, even today, 30 years later, I have uh, Psalm 18:28. You, O Lord, you, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. And uh, that's another verse that God's going to use in my life and that will be there if I'm going to minister to somebody and share with them. 
Now listen, God has the the ability. It's God who will keep your lamp burning. He'll refill you and refresh you and renew you. It is God who will re-inspire you. It's also God who will turn that darkness into light. He'll bring you right out of it. Well, that's a tremendous verse that tells us of the work of God and the good nature of God. And it's what He's going to do in your life and my life. And that's what we count on. Well, faith comes from hearing. How can anybody believe on whom they've not heard? Well, that's what the question is brought up in Romans 10. They cannot. Again, the issue of inability. Ability comes when somebody hears the message. Faith comes from hearing the message, hearing the Logos, the Word, the message of Christ. In the gospel is a power. That's why Paul can say this in Romans in the beginning. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God. So when people are hearing one verse, two verse, I can remember after 23 years of trying to deal with my father and, and trying to lead him to Christ and operating and you know loving him and ministering to him and praying for him. And he lived in California. I've flown out there, I don't know, close to 30 times. Finally, when deeply impressed by God, one more time to go. And I flew out there, and I, and I finally, after talking to him, I told him how I led his mother, my grandmother, to Christ, how she's in heaven. And I shared things, and he still rejected. He didn't want to listen. And one day I went to his trailer, his mobile home, and I said, Dad, I'm here to tell you. He wanted me to get out. He was almost angry, that hostility of the sin nature at 70 years old, that stubbornness. But God is uh, willing that none should perish. He's not willing that anybody, anybody should perish. And I've been praying and praying and praying. And you know what? I said, God, I said, Dad, let me give you one thing that God says. And I, I quoted one scripture. And he listened. And I looked at him as he thought through that verse. As he began to think. And uh, as he began to think about that word of God, it's like the wall was cracked. And I shared another verse. And I begin to see that stubbornness breaking down. And I begin to see the walls crumbling. And I shared another thing and another verse and another thing and another scripture. And a faith comes from hearing. An operating work uh, to break into that will that is in bondage. Now is being uh, em- empowered, uh, given the ability to believe. The Spirit of God is operating then. Like in Lydia in the book of Acts, that the Lord opened her heart by the operation of the Spirit of God. He opened her heart to do what? To respond to the message. That's the work of the Spirit of God. So it's crucial that in your counseling and on the field, specifically with non-believers, because you're going to get non-believers coming in, uh, that when you're sharing with them, don't just deal with their problems and say, let's, let's do this, 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 and these procedures. What you've got to do is share the word with them, share the gospel with them, because that is the content, the powerful content uh, that God will use to um, open them up to uh, and give them the ability. It's like God has come in to push back the darkness, pull off the blinders. He's beaming the radiant, powerful light of the Word of God. He is uh, operating by the Spirit of God. He's holding back the darkness as you're penetrating uh, with them with the Scripture. And uh, the Spirit of God is doing His work as witnessing and pointing to Christ as you begin to pour Jesus out to them and share with them. Please understand something then they will have the ability to respond. Then they will have the ability. And that's true in counseling Christians who are depressed and down and everything else. Giving a word of faith, giving the scripture, what the Holy Spirit wants you to tell them in in particular, and ministering to their lives. Uh, Because that gives them the ability. So as we say in point B, page 25, faith comes from hearing the word of God. Uh, comes from hearing uh, any of the Word of God or the specifics that the Spirit of God wants to apply. Point two under that is the work of the Spirit of God. He is there gonna, He's going to work and work and work and work. He's there to get them to believe. He's there to get them uh, to respond. He's there to uh, open the perception in their mind, heart, and so forth. Uh, He's there to cut through. So I don't care how blinded Satan has people. I don't care how demonized people are. I don't care what's going on. I just know this, that the Word of God 
uh, can cut through all of it. Now, the battle rages when we read the parable of the sower, when Jesus says, the birds of the air, remember what he said? That Satan comes to take the word of God out of their heart so that they cannot believe and be saved. See, the word's got to be sown in. They can't be saved without it. And Satan wants to take it out of their heart through whatever series of uh, uh, wrestling it out through them, the arrows, again, of the enemy, uh, where Satan is trying to pull it out and give them excuses and get it out of them, their lives. Well, listen, we got to get it into their lives. Uh, unbelievers cannot be saved without it. The, word of the, the work of the Holy Spirit will work with it. Uh, the word of God, and uh, you will help them come. That's why they will be accountable for their choice. Uh, they'll be accountable if they reject Jesus Christ. And the truth is, you, you need to be able to say that to individuals in your office. Uh, and I've said it to personalities in multiples, that if they reject Jesus Christ, nothing human goes to heaven that rejects Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's one principle I, I'm, I'm very sure of. And... Uh, it's very important that we share uh, that other side, too, that if someone's obstinate, and no matter what you give them, no matter what you say to them, no matter what, uh, you know, we read about this also in, uh, in the book of Hebrews, uh, that they can trample the blood of Christ. They can insult the spirit of grace, and all that's left is judgment. Uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, we read the, the famous verse, God so loved the world, of course, or in verse 17, he didn't send Jesus to condemn the world, but to save the world. Well, when you come towards the end of that chapter, and you read where it says that those who believe, you know, receive life, and those who reject do not receive that life, but the wrath of God remains on them. And that is true. In their sin and in their choice to rebel and to keep turning away, yeah, they can lose their soul, and you'll need to tell people that to allow the conviction, but also keep sharing that God loves them and wants to bring them out. So when it comes to ability, faith comes from hearing. The Spirit of God works when somebody is born of God. Now this changes everything. This is the exciting thing because now God enters into the act of salvation. Forgiveness, like we said in nine, uh, session 9. Uh, freedom, like we said. Justification is declared. But also now, this operative work of God, the new nature comes in. God implants us with the new nature. His presence comes in. Literally, Jesus Christ comes to live in you, live in them. And everything that He wants to operate in and through their life. So they are born of God. We, we, we mentioned again, I'll mention now uh first john chapter 3 about they cannot go on sinning because the seed of god remains lives dwells the greek word minnow uh dwells in them is operative there's a new nature operative and so the proof of a real believer in jesus is that the spirit of god the new nature uh dwelling in them in christ uh is pushing them away from sin and into righteousness and uh, that, that, that the new nature is more powerful than the old nature. The old nature is rendered powerless. And this is very important. Salvation uh, is operative. It's powerful. It's more powerful than what Satan and sin is all about. I'm really kind of tired of people glorifying the, how heavy the old nature is and sin. All that, it's true outside of Christ. But the conqueror and the victor has come. Oh, victory in Jesus. That's the hymn we sing. Um, and we read about this is the victory that overcomes the world uh, even our faith in Christ overcomes the sin issue and even overcomes Satan Nike, the Greek word Nike a decisive final victory is used in 1 John chapter 2 verse 14 uh, for those who believers who grow strong and they overcome they have victory over Satan because the word of God lives in them so very important for us to know that and you can't be born again without the word of God you're born again by the word of God when you accept Christ you're accepting the word that has been planted in you to save you and you're accepting it and the, and the explosion of new birth occurs inside uh, implanting you with the new life hallelujah that is what you have that is what every believer in front of you that you deal with has uh, and that can be um, drawn up in a sense as you share with them through their problems uh, Satan doesn't want them to know it all and keep them ignorant in it and keep you know us ignorant in that great depth of salvation but God has come to liberate and uh, 
That's what happens within the will. We are liberated. Now, that takes us to point C. And this is the great news. Because I'm going to tell you this, that God liberates the will and empowers it to be active, powerful, choosing, cooperating with God. Now, we're going to talk about some of the influences that bring us to passivity of will, which uh, negates us um, um, yielding to the operative work of the new nature. Let's take a look at point C, page 25. The will and the power of God. Point one, it is God who works in you. Now, that's Philippians 3, uh, chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, I love chapter 1, verse 6, though. Let me read this verse to you. And this is very important. It is, uh, you know, he who began. Now, this is, this is Paul's very, he's confident. The Spirit of God refers to this incredible, uh, indefeatable confidence. Uh, he's indefeatably uh, confident that he, Christ, uh, who began a good work, there's that word again, operative uh, supernatural grace, that good uh, operative uh, supernatural uh, power, he who began a good work in you, will he will carry it on to completion to the day of Christ. Here's where you have the issues of justification, sanctification, glorification. The same Jesus purchased all for you, for them. The point of salvation is justification, as if you've never sinned, you're born of the Spirit of God, you're made alive to Christ and made right. Sanctification is a demonstration that the new nature is within, the power of God is in you with the propensity, the movement, the compelling. Uh, read this in Romans chapter 8 when it talks about predestination. Predestination is not a Calvinistic thing. In Romans chapter 8, you know what it is? It's referring to believers only in that, in that context. I have been predestined in Christ to be conformed to the image of God, not just out of obligation, but out of the empowerment, out of the design, the sovereign design of God is victory. The sovereign design of God is abundant life in Christ. The sovereign um, predestination involves every promise and every word and every working of God is now mine in Christ Jesus. And I read this in Ephesians chapter 1. Every spiritual blessing of God is, is mine in Christ. And uh, this is the exciting thing. Every promise of God is yes, not yes and no, but yes in Christ. And here again, we have this uh, absolutely incredible uh, working of God. He began it. He is carrying it on. So anybody who comes to your office or your meet in the field, you're ministering to, you can have a confidence that God is operative. God is wanting to take any and every believer from weakness to strength, from faith to faith, from victory to victory. He wants them to grow. He wants them to uh, to develop. Uh, God wants them, you know, Satan doesn't want them. That's why there's a battle. Sin, if they get into sin, will we'll, we'll put a chink, uh, a kink in that development. We are told to grow up in our salvation. Uh, we are told to grow in the grace and knowledge of God. That's what discipleship is about. Discipleship helps us yield to the powerful sanctification that the Spirit of God is applying based on the new nature in Christ. And this is a tremendous thing as you're dealing with individuals. An active will. It is God who's, you know, that, that, it, that he who began a good work, he will carry it on to completion to the day of Christ. He's operating in your life for that same purpose. Uh, you and I could get stronger and uh, grow and uh, we could overcome the issues of sin and be free and, and develop. And, and uh, we read in Ephesians that in our knowledge of God, we'll begin to be able to better bear the image of God. That's the goal. The Spirit of God inside you has the goal of allowing the image of God, which is powerful and joyful, and uh, again, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, is the manifestation you're going to hear me say towards the end of this whole session that this, by faith we receive the work of God, by obedience we manifest the power and the presence of God in that new life. By faith we receive all, by obedience we manifest. We experience personally and manifest outwardly uh, what God has done inwardly. Well, in point C, uh, I mentioned uh, Philippians 2.13 also. Now notice again, it is God, this is only in reference to Christians. Now God is working on non-Christians to come to Christ. But 
for the believer, there's an inward working the new, from the new nature. God is alive and operative inside of you. You are the temple of the Spirit of God. Jesus said, Father, that I myself might live in them. So when I say Christ, new nature, or Spirit of God, it's, it's all one and the same. Um, Christ is dwelling in you and has given you a new nature. And the operation of that nature is the Spirit of God moving you because uh, you're freed from the old nature and from Satan's ownership. And so you can grow. And, and uh, so the scripture says it is God, God, listen, in your very being, in the depths of the depths of you and the counselees that come in, God is at work uh, to get them to thrust out any sin issues, to appropriate the faith and victory that is in Jesus Christ. He's at work operating uh, in their lives, uh, obviously to free them from any demonic stuff. And get them into obedience. So does God is at work in you to will and do according to His good pleasure. He wants you to obey the Word. He wants you to uh, you know walk in the Spirit. Now listen, James chapter one says anybody who obeys the Word will be blessed in what they do. Obviously, and so you, it's not a matter of just knowing a scripture verse. Have you put it into practice? Uh, only then do you find the fruit of it in your life. Point two under C, page 25, uh, the will is liberated. Listen, the liberated and empower will, empowered will, 2 Peter 1, three. we've mentioned this already. Also, I'm saying this to get to the point of the issue of passive, the passivity of will. That God, uh, His divine power has given us, that's a perfect tense in the Greek, meaning that at the point of salvation, with the abiding result right now in your life, the operative divine power of God is working. He's given you everything you need. I've heard Christians, I can't live the Christian life. Yes, you can. Do you know this? Do you know first you know Second Peter chapter one, verse three? No. Do you know uh, Romans chapter eight, verses one and two? No. Do you know Romans chapter six? No. Well, that's part of the reason of the defeat of the believer. Uh, and their squandering of their Christian life. And uh, so much of the depression and everything else. They don't know how to they don't know how to pray. They don't know how to grow. They don't know how to take care of themselves. They don't know how to seek the Lord. They don't know how to put uh, thanksgiving to God in practice. That's part of growing in the Lord. To accept all of it by faith, but to put, uh, to to see it manifest uh, in experience in your life and uh, and out of your life is uh, through your obedience. And if you really believe, biblical faith moves you to inseparably to obedience. Faith is proved by that. I'll show you my faith by what I do. So if I believe that Christ has set me free from the power of sin, then I operate on that basis because it's real. Objectively and subjectively, it's real. And I am free. And so I can say I'm free. If I feel tempted, temptation is an aggravation, not a sin. But let me tell you this. My will is liberated and empowered. Your will is liberated and empowered. And every single person who really is a believer in Christ, born of the Spirit of God, is liberated and empowered. Uh, to be active. Uh, to choose. Because God is there working to will that way. And we've been given the power to do so. All that we need for the Zoe, the Christ-like life and uh, devotion to God. All that we need. Now that's very important. That's the foundational issues of this passive will. Page 26, when we go to the passivity of will... Now, this deals with this. Why? You know why? You know why we're touching on this? Because uh, it's all about depression and oppression. Sometimes they, they, they go together, but sometimes they don't. Depression and oppression. Let me just mention quickly right now that depression. Now I was reading uh, Archibald Hart, uh, Dr. Hart from uh, the Fuller Theological Seminary School of, World, Psycholo World School of Psychology and uh, his book on depression. He was mentioning how 80, every 87% of all depression is cognitive. That means life issues. Uh, that uh, they don't have a tumor in their head. Jay Adams speaks about this too. That, you know, unless you have a tumor in your head or something chemically, I mean, like a, again, something really radically wrong, diseased or whatever else, most all depression is a cognitive thing over a period of time. And um, oppression can be there too, and the and the demonic sometimes brings oppression that moves you to depression. Now let me explain this as we go along. Page twenty six, and I just pray that God again gives us the insight that we need 
And uh, I believe that a lot of people that have gone through this little segment before have been ministered to personally too, so that we understand. I have learned that I can get out of being depressed in a few minutes now. I really have, no matter what it is. I can tell you in my own life there's been times of great struggle, great pain, great hurt, uh, and it has brought days of of depression. It has brought times when I felt so horrible about issues that there's been times in the past that I didn't want to be, be involved in ministry. I didn't want to be a pastor any longer. There's been times that I felt that way. But I've learned never make big decisions when you're tired, when you're depressed. You've got to make them when you're uh, before the Lord and uh, being led by the Lord. But I've realized that I, I can make a choice. You know, so many times we just want God to come in and invade. Sometimes He comes and blesses us and strengthens us and so forth. But um, I've also found that uh, things can, feelings can change when uh, our mental activity changes. When we yield to the Lord and and we believe the Lord and allow the Spirit of God to work and uh, we begin to thank the Lord and uh, trust Him, uh, everything can change. Under D, page 26, it says this, damaging the will uh, the, and, 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 and the passive will. Now, sin obviously does that. Sin incapacitates, enslaves. Uh, getting into sin issues can bring depression. Christians can be depressed because they're grieving the Spirit of God. They're not living in the fire of God. They can be depressed because they see other Christians excited and happy and growing in the Lord. I have people write me all the time. Talks about, you know, oh, I heard you on this radio program. I heard you on this thing. And uh, you sound like you really know the Lord. And I don't know the Lord. And, and they're, they're like, I'm depressed. I don't feel like I, you know, and so I've got to go through. There's nothing special about me or any other good believer. I want to be a good believer. Uh, there's times I, I think, man, Russ, you need to grow. You need to develop. You know, and I see people that inspire me. And I thank God for people in history that I've read about. Uh, but I also know about Elijah, great prophet of God, walk with God. I also know that he got greatly depressed, so much so that he went outside, dismissed his servant, got by himself, went out there. His emotions were taking over because of his mental fears uh, and, his, and, and his falling into unbelief. And so he cries out, I've had enough, I want to die. And uh, God had to do some working in his life to bring him out of that. You know, the Word of God tells us, you know, not to become weary in well-doing, not to give up. And there's reasons for that. Um, Sin can bring a damaging uh, weakness to our will and uh, bring a passivity where we think, man, I just, I fall into this sin again and again and again. I don't even know if I can, you know, uh, uh, try again. I'm just, you know, I'm just a stupid, you know, we put, we went to, you know, put put ourselves down or whatever. You're going to see that a lot. And uh, the demonic realm also brings, uh, loves to bring, you know, to to enslave your will, to those flaming arrows to bring into believers' lives. God's not with you. You're not going to make it. You're not really strong. And, you know, if they begin to believe those oppressive, uh, involuntary feelings and thoughts, uh, their will can become passive. They don't choose to do the will of God and... uh, they don't maintain their strength. The will of God is to lift up the shield of faith to extinguish every flaming arrow. And if we're passive, you know, there's a lot of believers, and I you know what? Let's let's just let's just let's just bring this out. In the body of Christ, if all we've done is teach Christians to be spectators in a fifty minute service, that they just sit and listen to us, they're gonna it's like a bird, a baby bird that all they know to do is open their mouth with a mother bird coming to feed them every time. Um, you know, sooner or later, that mama bird wants to kick that baby bird, you know, out of the nest to fly on its own and learn how to get its own food. You know, when we disciple people, we don't want to spoon feed them all the rest of our life. We want them to learn how to go to the Word, how to get into the Scriptures, how to memorize Scripture, how to let the Holy Spirit bring to remember the Scripture, how God can interact with them, and how they can grow. Um, there's a lot of Christians that are 5, 10, 15 years old in the Lord uh, that are no different they were than, than in the first six, seven months of being saved. And it's a sad thing. And so many of you counselors and many of you who are, are ministering to others, um, half of what you do is going to be discipleship. Teaching them 
how to come before the Lord, how to repent, how to grow, how to do spiritual warfare, how to be filled with the Spirit of God. It's all those things that should be taught along the way uh, for them to progressively develop and uh, continue to grow stronger and stronger. That's, that's, that's Acts chapter 9, verse 22. When Paul got saved, a few days later, Ananias came over and he prayed to get filled with the Spirit of God. He began to witness and share about Jesus. And you know what verse 22 says? He grew more and more powerful. Now listen, let me ask you, are you growing more and more powerful? It cannot happen without the development of, uh, of, of learning the Word, appropriating the Word, putting it into practice, obeying the Word. Listen, you receive it all, you receive all the grace and mercy by faith. You manifest it in obedience. Very important. Let me miss, l- l- list number three, the issue of uh, pain and the events of life. You know, so many things you go through, uh, you see people come in, they're going through the same things. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. See how it comes to play. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Father of compassions, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles, so that we then in turn can comfort others with the comfort we've received. So much of what you give out is what you've got. And uh, that's why it's great. Make God your refuge. Go to the Lord. Get your answers. See, some of the best counselors are those who've experienced the great working of the Lord in their own life. And it's very important that you understand how to. where do you take your pain? Where do you take when you get discouraged, fearful? Where do you go? What do you do with it? Um, that has a lot to do with how you're going to share with others. If you're experiencing God uh, giving you grace, victory, and so forth. But sometimes in people's lives, pain and events. A divorce can set somebody off and they can become very passive, depressed, and so forth and they don't want to try, or they don't want to do something, or they begin to do something to overcome their feelings. Uh, they go to the highs and lows. People can call it bipolar, or man, old manic depressives, where they get really high and excited, but then they go low to their deep, deep lows. And uh, they then affect their own chemical system within, and then they think they need all the chemicals, and all of that comes into play. Um, but pain does bring pre- pressure to the will and hurt, loss of a job. You can go over the list of uh, issues of someone in your life, a loved one dies or divorce or loss of job, income, homes. Those are some of the biggies that occur in life. And uh, tragedies. Can you imagine people in Katrina and other places? Well, then we move on to the next point as far as those who've been through satanic ritual abuse um, and their, their, their will has been divided up into alter personalities, both by the trauma and by purposeful creation. And they've been altered. Now, that happens in sexual abuse or somebody who's been robbed and uh, somebody who's a gun's been put in, you know, to your head. I was listening to the news today about uh, home invasions. And they came in and they took a mother with her two-year-old child and beat her up and took her out to her car and made her drive to an ATM and all that. That's going to bring trauma to life. And it does take uh, getting over and uh, and seeking the Lord, and and then you know this is a person that might you know feel fearful and have five locks on all their doors, that wants to have a gun. Now, what is the response to all of the trauma? Uh, you can deepen your trauma uh, through wrong responses. So when we begin to deal with this issue of uh, the damaging of the will and making the will passive, sin does it, Satan does it, pain and the events of life can become heavy burdens uh, again the psalm writer god doesn't condemn you for having bad you know feelings of anguish and and pressure and so forth it's what you do with it uh it's what you do with it that will determine a lot of things in your life and the quality and depth and uh in your future and destiny something's going to occur it's and I, even when i've seen believers go out and begin to witness for christ get shut down the first time they never want to do it again or they, want, they begin to practice their spiritual gift and mess up the first time and they never want to do it again. Again, they're moving. Uh, instead of letting God operate actively in their will, in their, in their life, to will to do according to His good pleasure, which is His perfect good and pleasing will, and which is good for us, uh, blessed for us, uh, when things occur, well, then we quit. I hate to see Christians who've given up and quit. I really do. Uh, who've given up and, and they're depressed and so forth. 
Well, um, this is where we go into point E concerning ministry to the will and, and, and leading people to choice. Uh, it's very important if you see a weak-willed individual or a, a, a person's will who's passive or they're just wanting you to do it all for them. I've had people brought to me and it's like, pray off all the demons and get me all feeling good and send me out of here. And uh, that's not how it's going to work. That's why, again, in a freedom encounter, you're looking at an individual. They just want to get out of their pain. The issue is, as you're looking at them, listening to the Lord, listening to them, writing down and mapping out everything, bringing Scripture, all that God wants you to minister to them, not just get them over the guilt or get them out of pain or get rid of oppressive demonic presence, uh, but take them to fullness in Christ. They may want all the good feelings, but not want Jesus. Kind of like in the New Testament. They all wanted to get fed by food, but they didn't want to they want to yield to Jesus and believe him and take up the cross. So um the impact of I mean, look at the, the ten lepers that were all healed by Jesus. Grace can go out to you. I mean, there's people that we've ministered to, and man, they got set free, they got blessed, everything else. A week later, uh, you know, they didn't show up in church, they're not growing in the Lord, they don't get their Bible with them, uh, they're not really following Jesus. Um, so you wonder what's what's going on that you'll probably end up seeing them again. And um, that's why I'm saying that it's not just the trouble that they're saying; it's all they God's providentially brought them before you, so that He can get to what to them uh, what He wants. So you may be used um, by the Lord wonderfully. In uh, excuse me, speaking to them, praying for them, bringing them the word of faith, uh, so that God can uh, work, operate in them to will and do according to His good pleasure. To get them to choose, to get them to choose, take up the cross and follow Christ, deny self. That's choice. Uh, that is choice. Um, you know, to to have a pr- quiet time with the Lord every day is choice. To obey the Lord in each and everything is choice. But in that obedience, you cannot bear fruit without obedience. You cannot uh, experience the fullness of Christ without that obedience. You just cannot. And so, again, faith receives, obedience manifests. Point E, page 26. Here's what we have. Ministry to the will and the choice. Jesus' will to do the will of God. That is, uh, we find that in the book of Hebrews. Uh, I've come to thy will, O my God, O God. There was a will in Jesus, you know. Uh, even in the praying, may this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So again, the choice to do the will of God. Romans 12 tells us that God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. There's nothing higher than the will of God. Now, we also read in Timothy where uh, there's certain individuals who got off into cultic teaching where it says Satan has taken them captive to do his will. Uh, multiples have been taken captive to do Satan's will. Cultic teachers and those who are getting into cultic teaching have been taken captive to do Satan's will. Those who are into deep-seated sin issues, addictive sin issues, have been taken captive, and they are doing the will of Satan. And uh, Jesus wants to pluck them out of that and bring them into the will of God. Now, it's the will, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wills all men to be saved. Jesus was willing to save Jerusalem, all of Israel. But he said, you are not willing. And there's a, they were left to be desolate as a nation. And uh, there will be, of course, prophetically a work, but we're not going to get into that right here. But in people's lives... They're going to have to choose. They're going to have to choose if they want the will of God uh, or go off on their own selfish you know, realm to end up doing Satan's will. Um, and so it's very important that we realize that Jesus paved the way in this. He learned uh, obedience from what he suffered even. And to I have found it's more important, no matter what occurs in your life as a Christian, be faithful, you'll never regret it. Stay prayed up, praised up. You're not going to regret that. What you're going to regret is that in the mission, and what they're going to regret is in the issues of life, if they keep giving in to depression, uh, if they keep giving in to sin, if they keep giving up, that's what they get sick and tired of, and they know that God doesn't want them there, and God wants them to victory, God wants them to grow, God wants them to strength. God has chosen you and I and them uh, to bear fruit. We've been chosen to bear fruit. 
and uh, we're, to, we're to grow in that way, but you, it has to be a, a cooperative and active will uh, in the presence of God. And uh, so there's the looking at Jesus and surrendering. Romans 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. To, in view of all the mercy of God, leading people to uh, simply surrender. Now let me tell you a quick story about this idea of surrender or yieldedness. I heard this story years and years ago, and it illustrates this point very, very good. And I've shared it to individuals and in churches, and I've seen the response how God has used this little story. I don't know if it's even true, but it's a story. Uh, that illustrates this truth of yieldedness or offering ourselves to God. The story is of, a, of, a, of an Indian man, a uh, native Indian, that went to a church and stood in an aisle, and it came time for the offering, and uh, the ushers uh, came around with the offering plates, and as they came to the Indian, the usher held out the plate, and the, uh, and the Indian stood up and, uh, and looked at the usher, and the usher looked a little bit perplexed, and the Indian finally looked at it and said, Lower it! And the usher kind of looked strange, and he lowered uh, where he was holding out the the offering uh, plate. He lowered it a little bit. And the Indian stood there with his arms crossed, and he looked at the usher again, and he said, Lower it. And the usher lowered it a little bit further, kind of just, you know, wondering what in the world's going on here. And the Indian looked at him again, and he said, Lower it. Well, the usher got a little bit perturbed at this time, and he took it, and he sat it on the ground. Then the Indian stepped into the offering plate. Now that is what we're talking about. Offer your lives, your your bodies as a living sacrifice, surrendering to the Lord Jesus that you're going to trust and follow him. That it includes this, though, no longer being conformed to the patterns of the world or sin issues. It's a choice. It's a choice. When we're led by God in the Word and the Spirit in services or in a counseling service, you're leading, listen, you're leading people to choose the good and pleasing and perfect will of God. You're leading people to cooperate with the God, with God who's operative in them to do His will. It's all about doing His will and to cooperate actively. Each scripture will do that. Each movement of the Spirit will do that. You can be sure of that. And so as they uh, yield to the Lord, they step up to offer themselves to Christ, no longer be conformed by the old fleshly patterns, But instead, they're going to allow themselves to be renewed. There's an operating grace when that happens. When we yield, just like a hose when you're washing the car, and uh, the water's coming out, but all of a sudden it gets kinked. And the water is coming through one side, but it's not coming out the other. Well, that's what you have in front of you many times. Lives that have been kinked through sin, through demonic stuff, through whatever it might be. And uh, God wants to unkink them so the flow can roar on through... And that's what surrender and yieldness is all about. And that's where there's an operative grace. When you surrender and yield the Spirit of God, that means you're really willing to obey, and the Spirit of God is able then to uh, flow through as you're obeying the Lord Jesus. Um, you receive it all by faith, uh, grace and mercy, all by faith. It's manifested, however, in obedience. Look at point two of page 26. And it says this, prayer deliverance, demons, uh, you know, they get on the will also. And the issue is this, that when people give in to sin and depression, whatever else, then oppression comes or even attachment. And uh, the demons, the demonic likes to sit on and keep them incapacitated. That is not the will of God. That is not the design specific for believers. And so again, uh, if you recognize that, sometimes you can pray off the demons ahead of time. Uh, and then lead them to repentance. There's times that I've led people to repentance because attachment is not the same thing as full-blown possession and the manifestation of demonic control. So most of the time I lead somebody to repent, have them renounce uh, the demonic, and I also pray too. There's been times that I've prayed off the oppressive feelings that they had over an area or the sense of satanic stuff around them, they say, and I've prayed that off by the authority of Jesus And uh, then it was easier for them to make the choice to repent of sin, to shut the door on the enemy, and uh, to be liberated. So the deliverance prayers can help clear the air over a person uh, and uh, bring off that oppressive uh, um, pressure to keep the will from choosing God. That's the work of the enemy. That's the work of sin. 
And uh, whether in your life you feel this oppression coming against you and against you and against you, it's always going to be. Satan's attack in working is always about getting you not to do the will of God, not to trust God. And uh, and uh, the Word of God, the Spirit of the Lord, is uh, working in the opposite. But we must choose. So if you find somebody with passivity will, they won't even choose, they won't do anything, they're hopeless, whatever else, give them the Word of God. Pray over them. Get them to uh, to... To, to the point of believing and appropriating and accepting the Word of God and the truth, uh, that they're going to obey the Word of God. Point three, um, faith over hopelessness. Uh, a lot of times when people you know drop their faith, that's why it says in the book of Hebrews, see to it, brethren, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart that drifts away from the living God. Drifts. Because unbelief, brings passivity of will. Uh, you, you cannot have faith without active will. God works and operates in an active will. Uh, and that's very important in our in our development uh, in, in, in the development of our counselees and so forth. So faith over hopelessness. And that comes from the Word of God. Sometimes we just need to share the Word of God with people and, and bring the Word of God to people and so forth. You know, sometimes on the field I meet uh, totally backslidden believers and I start reminding them of Scripture and the tears come to their eyes and they remember the goodness and grace and mercy of God and they're not sure they can obtain it ever again and they're told that they can. And the stories of uh, David or the story of Job or the story of Peter and, and, and showing them that God renews his servants and leading them to repentance, leading them to faith, leading them to be refilled with the Spirit of God, and leading them to take up the cross to obey Jesus again, and grow in the Lord to become strong, so they never have to fall back in that state. Now that's that's what that's what it's all about. Depression comes because of uh, all kinds of life issues and circumstances. Um, the feelings of depression are there because of what's going on in the mental uh, activities of a person's life. If a person has become hopeless in their mental state, their feelings are going to come. You know, your feelings flow from your mental state. That's how it works. And you say, if, if you right now, you, let me ask you something. How do you feel? If I say, how do you feel? They say, man, I feel terrible. Well, what's the origin of that? If you feel terrible, well, I feel fearful. I feel uh, uh, like everything's come to an end. What's the origin of that? Let's, let's now let the Lord lead us to the origin of that and let's let God speak into that and let's and let's we can if we need to pray over that if the origin of that is spiritual attack arrows and so forth let's rebuke the enemy let's put on the armor of God let's lift up that shield of faith let's command the demons to get away and the oppression to go away and there might be instantaneous release We've seen that again and again and again and again in our offices when people have come over. Mainly people brought from other churches, Christians who never even understood the concept of armor of God, authority of Christ, and they had oppression, and uh, oppressive thoughts, um, and depressive feelings, and they don't know what they're doing wrong. And uh, we go through some things and we realize, hey man, the enemy's working against them. And so what we do for them, we also teach them to do for themselves then. Uh, so they can also because listen depressive listen when our mental state turns into you know hopeless things and and negative and so forth and even sinful stuff then our feelings are going to follow as a christian if you if you're knowingly sinning against the lord you know you're grieving the spirit of god you know you're quenching the power of the holy spirit and you're going to have a problem inside you're going to have a, a you're going to you're going to feel depressed and sooner or later you might feel oppressed by the enemy well Listen, depression um, is catabolic to your whole chemical system. Um, faith is anabolic. Now, the meaning of this is, is that anabolic means the growth and development and strength. The idea of catabolic means the opposite, growing weaker and, and breaking down. And this can occur to your spiritual, your chemical, and then your physical condition. Now let me mention again this book by Tim LaHaye years ago wrote on the area on depression, how to overcome depression, where he deals with depression coming from the spiritual, affecting the mental, affecting the emotional, and eventually that affects your chemical and even your physical state. Now, I want you to check this out. Romans chapter 4, when it talks about Abraham. Against all hope, 
In hope, Abraham believed God. Here's what it says. And he was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. He believed that God had power to do what he promised. Now see the word strengthened. He was strengthened in his faith. The Greek word there meaning that his entire physical frame was, it's almost as though his entire physical frame was straightened up and strengthened and healthy and strong based on his personal absolute faith in God and his promises. Faith will eventually affect every aspect of a human being. Faith will affect your spiritual dimension, your mental, your emotional, and even your chemical, physical situation on the inside. Literally, um, you can feel when you're living in real biblical faith and you're standing up in faith and you're giving thanks to God, you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, your mind is at peace, your emotions have the joy of the Lord, and guess what? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Your physical being is even strengthened when you're having oppressive stuff going on and depressive things going on and maybe you're not responding or, again, they're not responding correctly, um, then it will affect them. And ultimately, depression can affect the chemical system of a person on the inside. Here's where the chemical breakdown occurs. And instead of just giving them the drug, like an aspirin, an aspirin never takes away the pain, it masks the pain. It never takes away the cause of the headache, it only masks the pain so you don't feel it. That's what every kind of drug uh, does when it comes to depression. What has to happen is a change, both in uh, choice of will and belief and faith and hope, um, but also maybe, in some depressive cases, oppression. They don't know how to get rid of the demonic oppression. Now, you'll have a separate one-hour a CD or MP3 that works just deals just with the idea of oppression, um, attack, attachment, and then possession, and understanding the four different things. Um, and the better you can recognize the difference, like I could be depressed over, uh, you know, some, I, you know, I could, you know, be be really, but you know, if someone dies without Christ, I could be saddened. That's that's normal sadden, sadness. Um, I can uh, come outside and I have a I have a little old two thousand dollar truck sitting out there that I drive around. But I years ago I had a big old Ford, uh, third, 20, almost a thirty thousand dollar truck that I drove around. And the first day that I drove it into the driveway, my wife didn't know it was there, and she backed up and ran into the side of it. First day, um, and uh, you know what? My decision was it's only a truck, and it was an accident, and I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to uh, yeah I'm not going to let the truck own me. And I really didn't. And I, that little that that little dent or crease in the side of the truck was there to the day I got rid of it traded it in and um, now I've got a truck it doesn't matter if it's dented on any side I'm just glad that it runs so I want you to know that in all the things that people you know carry into the office um, a lot of it will push them to uh, passivity of will and we've got to lead them up out of that and uh, catabolic is uh, obedience will bring strength to the physical body strength to the chemical system of a body obedience is healthy disobedience is not healthy um, there's even studies concerning the way a person lives it can open the door to uh, diseases uh, Macmillan years ago wrote a book uh, called none of these diseases and there, there is a biblical, uh, and we'll talk about this maybe later on in healing, one of the MP3s just on healing, that, uh, that many times uh, bitterness can bring in headaches and bring in uh, depression and chemical changes in a body and can deteriorate the physical body. Bitterness can. And uh, many times when people have repented of bitterness, they found instantaneous healing uh, from the Lord Jesus. Point four. Here's what everybody has to do. They must believe, must choose, must act. They must put into practice, um, uh, you know, the will of God, the word of God, and uh, things can change. And that's what God comes to tell us to do, to believe in the Lord Jesus. 
and even as a believer, we're to trust. The whole book of Hebrews is written to Christians in bad and, and uh, sad situation, and they're called on to trust in the Lord completely, to not waver, uh, to not uh, you know, to quit you know, this thing about not meeting together. The whole issue of where they're, they're, they're depressed and they're shrinking back and all kinds of things going on, God's telling them, no, step over the plate and believe, choose, act, put into practice. Listen. That will bring people out of that passive will into an obedient, powerful will in which they can grow stronger and stronger and stronger and learn how to stand uh, on their own two feet. Well, the Lord bless you. This is Session 10 in Freedom Encounters, uh, ShatterTheDarkness.net. And uh, my prayers, and, the, and, I, and I pray the blessing of the Lord, and the blessing, may the, the, may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him that you might overflow with that indefeatable optimism that God gives by the power of the Holy Spirit. Bless you. See you later in session number...